This morning we're, um, as I've already mentioned, continuing the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we're going to be looking at what Jesus has to say about keeping our word. So let's begin by reading the, uh, the passage of Scripture, and that would be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 33 through 37. Would you please listen carefully as I read this? This is God's word. Jesus says, again, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, Jesus is reminding us in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that through the blessing of the new birth, that we are now part of the new creation. You know, Jesus essentially through his work has made all things new. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we actually become a part of the new creation, and so we are made new creatures in him. And as new creatures, we have new desires that, that are different than the ones that we had when we came into the world. Uh, when we came into the world, we didn't love the Lord, but now we do love him. When we came into the world, we didn't want to obey the Lord, but now we do. As new creatures, we will not be the same as we were before. Now, Jesus has been telling us in the sermon just how different our lives will, really will be. He's, he's shown us through the Beatitudes that our nature, our character, has been changed and will continue to be transformed into the same perfect and holy nature that Jesus has. Jesus said that this new nature also comes with a new ability to be able to influence the world around us for good. Remember before we were like the world, the only thing we could do was basically encourage the world to continue to do what it was doing before. But now being in the likeness of Jesus Christ through that Christ-likeness, we have the ability to hold it back from going the wrong direction uh, through our witness, personal witness, as well as through our words. And of course, through the message we share, we also have the ability now to bring light into the darkness of the world, the darkness of sin, the darkness of despair and hopelessness. We have good news, and we can share that good news now from, again, a character which is like Jesus' character. Now, in the section we're looking at now, Jesus says that our new nature will also change the way that we view and keep the law of God. That we will look beyond what it says on the surface, which is basically what the, uh, the Jewish leaders were doing. And if they, they kept just you know, what, what it says at face value, they believed that they were actually honoring and obeying and loving the Lord. Jesus says we'll look beyond that to the deeper lesson that each of these commandments is actually meant to teach us. And that is what it really means to love God and to love our neighbor. Now, so far we've looked at a couple of the commandments Jesus has been dealing with. He dealt with the sixth commandment. And he says that with the new nature, not only will we keep from murdering others and, and injuring them physically, we're also no longer going to want to hurt them. We won't get angry at them the way that we did before so that we want to hurt them in our hearts or maybe even kill them in our hearts. But also when we fail, and we, we all fail in many different ways, we will seek reconciliation. We will be the first to go to them to try and be reconciled to them. As Jesus said in the, uh, the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. We will be those who will strive for peace. And he went on from there to the seventh commandment where well, we also saw that not only with this new nature will we keep ourselves from adultery and every sexual sin, 
but we will also guard ourselves from wanting to commit them in our hearts. And if we're married, we will be faithful to our spouses. And um, as we've seen, again, with the idea of divorce and remarriage, if we have an unbiblical, we won't, we won't put away our spouse on unbiblical grounds. We won't want to um, contract into the marriage. We'll want to be faithful. Now, this morning, Jesus goes on to show us how differently we will keep the third commandment uh, because of this work of the Holy Spirit within us, because of this new nature. We won't do as the scribes and Pharisees, uh, making our vows or taking oaths in such a way as to try to circumvent the responsibility of actually having to keep them or taking an oath and bearing, you know, basically swearing to something that is false but thinking somehow that we're getting around that. No, we won't do that. Instead, we will be men and women of our words. We will speak the truth and when we make commitments, we will keep them. Now, we should begin by noting again that Jesus, in this, what he's saying here is, is addressing the third commandment. Let me just remind you again what the third commandment is in Exodus 20, verse 7. Uh, the Lord says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, he is addressing this commandment, but he is more specifically speaking to correct the rabbinic interpretation of this commandment. And again, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment, but he says in verse 33 of our passage, again, these familiar words which we've been hearing. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. He's talking about the rabbinic teachers, the rabbinic interpretation, what the Jews had basically done with the third commandment and how they had altered it in order to suit themselves so that they could consider themselves to be righteous when, as a matter of fact, they were strangers to the Lord. But now before we deal with the correction, let's first consider what this commandment is actually saying, the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, we often look at this commandment as, as simply a prohibition forbidding us from using God's name, any of His names, and the names of our Lord Jesus Christ as a swear word. Now, certainly this commandment is telling us not to do that. We are not to speak His name in some empty way, which is what vain means, empty or vanity. We're not to use it to express our frustration or our anger when the situations that we're in get too difficult, and I think you all know what I mean by that, okay? We're not to use it to swear and to curse somebody, and we're not to use it just simply to, to curse, as it were, when we get frustrated, when we get angry uh, at our situations. Now, the commandment does address that indirectly, but what it really has to do with is what we call swearing, but swearing in the good sense and not in the bad sense. Swearing means to take an oath or to make a vow. When we make a vow to do something, we call God to bear witness to what it is we're saying, that we are going to do what we've said we're going to do. And when we take an oath to tell the truth, we're calling on Him to bear witness to the fact that what we're saying is true. That's what it means to use the Lord's name. And to use it in vain means if you're not going to do what you said, or you're intending not to tell the truth, then essentially you're lifting his name up to a falsehood. You're using his name in vain. Now, Paul tells us that really all of our life is essentially to be a continual act of love and adoration and worship to God. Everything we do is to be worship to him. He writes in Romans 12, verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He goes on to tell us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's not telling us that we need to find an altar somewhere, climb up on the altar, and be burned alive to ashes. But what he is telling us is that we need to, to devote all of our powers 
powers of our soul, the powers of our body, to worshiping and serving the Lord. Everything we do is to be an act of worship. Well, swearing, again in the good sense, is one of the things that the Lord tells us that we are to do in our worship of Him. And that when we swear as an act of worship, that we are to swear only by His name. As a matter of fact, using His name honors Him. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 6.13, You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship Him and swear by His name. I want you to notice that is a commandment, and it is an act of worship. And as a matter of fact, the people of Israel were actually forbidden to swear by any other name or swear by any other thing because to do so is actually an act of idolatry. Joshua said to God's people before he died in Joshua 23, verses 6 through 8, he says, be very firm then. By the way, this is when Joshua's about to die and he's already brought them into the land. They're going to be tempted in the land to go after other gods and to do the things that people are doing in the land. We're in this world. There's a lot of people in the world that are doing evil things and will be tempted to do the same thing. So he's encouraging them before he leaves do the right thing, worship, and serve the Lord. He says this, be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left so that you will not associate with these nations these which remain among you or mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them, or bow down to them. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. I want you to notice again, swearing by the name of another God is worshiping that other God. We are to worship only God. We are to swear only by His name. Now again, that means if we're going to swear by His name, but we know that what we're swearing to is not true, that we're not going to speak the truth or we're going to bear witness to a lie, or we vow that we're going to do something and yet we're intending not to do that, we're calling upon God to bear witness to a lie and by so doing we're taking His name in vain. Now that's what the commandment is actually talking about. Now let's look at what Jesus is talking about in our passage. He's addressing the breaking of this commandment by the Jewish leaders. But they were breaking it in essentially the same way, but they thought they were avoiding that, okay? They thought if they could swear their oaths and their vows by things other than God, that the oath they took or the vow they made would not be binding upon them. It would not be valid. Now listen again to what Jesus says in verses 34 through 37 and see what it is that the Pharisees are actually trying to do here. He says, but I say to you, make no oath at all, and by the way, that's not absolute. He's going to qualify that. Make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, anything beyond these is of evil. Now, first of all, the word Jesus is using here when he says to make no oath, he's not talking just about oaths, but the word he uses there means to swear a vow or to make an oath. In other words, it includes both, the making, you know, the making of, uh, of uh, or taking of oaths and the making of vows. But again, when he says here not to do this, he doesn't mean not at all. Now, we've just seen that swearing is an act of worship when you swear by the name of the Lord. And we also have to bear in mind that we see examples in the Bible of those who actually made vows and who swore oaths even after Jesus gave this instruction. So they did not understand Jesus as basically saying that you should make no oath at all, make no vow at all, but rather you shouldn't be doing it the way they're doing it. I already gave you one example again in the meditation this morning, and let's read it again. Luke writes in Acts 18, verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren 
and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Cancrea, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Now, if you just think a little bit about what Paul was doing here and what he did at the end of this vow, it may sort of cue you in to the particular vow he had actually taken here. Uh, many commentators believe that what he had done was basically put himself under the vow of a Nazarite. That's a vow of devotion to the Lord. I mean, when you think about Paul, the last person you think who would need to make such a vow would be him because he had already devoted his entire life to the Lord to serve him and to honor him. By the way, that's what we've all vowed to do when we took up the charge to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But he binds himself even more carefully to serve him and to honor him. Now, during the time of this vow, he was supposed to abstain from eating or drinking anything that was connected to the grapevine. He was not to touch anything that had died, and nor was he to cut his hair. And at the end of the vow, you basically would cut the hair that grew during the time of the vow, and then you would offer it up to the Lord. Uh, perhaps Paul had his hair cut at Cancrea and perhaps took it then to Jerusalem to offer it on the altar. By the way, this is the same vow that Samson was under, the one that was basically to be binding upon him his entire life, and that's why when his hair was cut that his strength failed him. He lost it, okay, because of the vow of the Nazarite. So here's Paul taking a vow. Okay, it, is, it is certainly permissible, and actually it's given to us as an example that we ought to make vows and keep our vows. Now, Jesus himself also was put under an oath and testified under an oath when the high priest required it. We read in Matthew 26, verses 62 through 64, the high priest stood up and said to him, do you not answer? This is when Jesus is on trial. What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now the word that the high priest used here, adjure, means to demand under oath. His demand was that Jesus testify truthfully whether or not he was the Christ. The high priest was demanding an oath from Jesus. Now, the interesting thing here is that it was against the law, really, to make a man testify against himself. We have that, that same law, actually, in our own country. But Jesus knew that if he didn't answer the high priest's question, that it would be tantamount to denying the fact that he is the Christ. And so he testified, even knowing what it was that they were going to do uh, with that information. He knew that they were going to use it against him, but he still determined that he was going to speak it. And his reply, you have said it yourself, is essentially the same thing as saying, you are correct. I am the Christ. Now, Jesus is not saying uh, in, in our text this morning that we should never swear if the situation requires it. But what he is telling us is this, that when you swear an oath or a vow, there is really no way to avoid invoking God to bear witness to what it is you're swearing. I want you to notice the Jews were actually trying to get around their obligation to keep their promises and to speak the truth. Jesus says, don't make an oath by heaven. If you swear by heaven, Jesus says, you haven't avoided God because that's his throne. If you swear by the earth, that's his footstool. If by Jerusalem, that's his city. If by your head, which sounds strange to us, but in the Jewish culture, it was a very common way the Jews would swear. And when they swore by their head, they were essentially saying, by my life, I swear this to be true. Jesus says, God is even in control of that. You can't change the color of your hair. You can't make one hair black or white. But God is the one who knows the number of hairs on your head. God is the one who is actually in control. Whenever you swear by these things, Jesus says, you are swearing by him. Everything is connected to him. 
So rather than trying to avoid being responsible for what we say, we need to mean what we say. Jesus says in verse 37, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. In other words, Jesus is saying we are to let our words be our bond, our pledge, our guarantee that what we're saying is the truth or that we are fully intending to do what it is we said we would do. Now again, think about the applications of this today with regard to oaths that we might possibly take. Sometimes we're called upon to be witnesses in in our culture, um, in a court of law. If we're a witness to a particular crime, we are sworn in to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and so forth. Okay, when we take that vow or that make that oath, actually, we need to speak the truth. Sometimes the situations are a bit more personal. Maybe we're not in a court of law, but we're still called upon to bear witness to something that we have seen in a personal situation. Whenever our testimony is needed to settle a dispute, we must only say what we know to be the absolute truth. By the way, what what happens when we lie? Well, we're sinning, right? But when we lie, uh, whose character and nature are we reflecting? The devil, who is the father of lies. But when we speak the truth, we're reflecting the nature of Jesus. Let me just mention this too, that uh, we need to be careful with the truth because sometimes we can speak the truth in a malicious way and we can use the truth to get people into trouble when perhaps those particular truths are things we should keep to ourselves. So we need to be careful even about how we use the truth. We use it to do what is right, to speak the truth when we need to, to settle a particular dispute, but we also use it to build up one another and not tear each other down. Now this also means that if we've made vows or promises, we do need to keep those. If you're a member of of a church, or actually if you're a member of this particular church, you you do need to remember that you and I both have made certain promises. We, We testified or confessed that we believe certain things to be true, and we need to continue to uphold those things and believe those things. We said that we believe the Bible is true, you know, and that's what we need to continue to maintain and actually live as though it is true, because it is true, read it and and believe it and, and follow it. We, we confess that God is triune. That's what distinguishes him from all the other gods of the world. Besides the fact that he's really the only God that exists, he is triune. We confess that Jesus is the Son of God who became a man in order to save us and that we are trusting in him alone for our salvation. Okay, we need to maintain those things, but In our vows, we also made these promises to leave this world behind, to forsake the world, to fight against all of our sins, and to serve the Lord with our whole life, even as we saw Paul tell us we're obligated to do by the mercies of God. We actually stood here and promised that we were going to do that, but more than just this audience, we also had God as our audience. Now some of us stood up here and we actually made vows on how we would raise our children. We promised that we would teach them God's truth. We promised that we would train them in the ways of the Lord. We promised that we would pray for them and we also promised by God's grace and all these things are by His grace to set an example of godliness for them. Those of us here who are married made certain promises when we got married that we would love and cherish our spouses throughout the entirety of our lives, no matter what happens. Now, Jesus tells us this morning that we need to step back and consider how we're doing in all these different areas, okay? Have we been men and women of our words? Have we been speaking the truth? Have we been keeping our commitments? When we said yes to something, Are we following through with those things? Now, Jesus says that that is what the new nature will will bring about in our lives. That is what we'll want to do. That is what we will do. Even though we won't do it perfectly, we'll still strive to do it perfectly because 
His Spirit is working the image of Jesus in us. Now, we know that that is what we will do because we know that that's what Jesus did. You know, um, he did everything that he's telling us to do. You, you read the Bible and you look at what God is calling us to do in all these different circumstances and sometimes it gets a little bit confusing and we're led to go one direction or another and not really understanding what, what God really wants us to do. But there is one person that you can look at as an example in the Scripture and you can know that he did it right. So if you want to know how it's done, look at how Jesus did it. That's how he wants us to do it. And that's what he's actually working in us by his Holy Spirit. So what do we know about Jesus with regard to the commandments we've already looked at? Jesus never murdered anybody. Jesus never got angry with his brothers or injured them with his tongue. At least he didn't in an ungodly or an unjust way. We do know that there were times when he spoke out against the scribes and the Pharisees for their hypocrisy because they were leading the people of God astray, because they knew who he was and they still denied him. Sometimes Jesus even used imprecations. Okay, we've asked the question, when do you use or do you use the imprecations that are in the Psalms? Well, what did Jesus do? There were times when he used them and he used them against the scribes and the Pharisees when justice demanded it, but he was never doing this from an unrighteous anger or a vindictiveness or desire for revenge. What he did was absolutely righteous. Jesus didn't come to take away life. Jesus came to save life by laying down his life. Jesus didn't use his words to injure people. He used them to heal and to lead other people to salvation. He came to reconcile us with his Father. When we move to the seventh commandment, we see that Jesus was perfectly happy with the way the Lord made him, something which, again, is becoming, you know, something that's up in the air for the people of the world today. We need to be happy with what the Lord has made us. Jesus never lusted after any woman. And Jesus was always faithful to his spouse. You know, Jesus is married, and he's married to us, the church. We are his bride. Jesus laid his life down for us so that he might have us, and that he might love us and care for us for the rest of time. And you know what? He's faithful in doing that. He has loved us. He has cared for us. He has done what is necessary to provide for us forever. He will follow through. And he is our example on how we ought also to love our spouses. His yes was always yes, and his no was always no. He always spoke the truth. He always kept his word. Now, Jesus did these things to save us. Jesus did these things to be an example for us, but he also did these things so that he might give us his Holy Spirit so that we too might have the power that we need to follow his example. Jesus has given us the ability to do this. He's given us the call to do this. This is what he desires of us. Now, as we come to the table this morning, this should remind us that we again need to look to Jesus basically to give us the strength we need to follow his example so that we might be more like him, and particularly in this area this morning, that we might be men and women of our word. Our word should be our bond. It should be the guarantee. It should put an end to the dispute. We need to speak the truth. We need to follow through in our commitments. Let's be, again, like our Lord Jesus. That's what he calls us to be. So let's take just a few moments and let's uh, bow in prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and give us the grace to be able to do this. And as we think about the grace that we need to do this, let's prepare ourselves also to come to the table. Now we will take just a couple of moments and, and read the 1 Corinthians passage again just to remind us of what it is we need to do in order to get ready to come to the table. But right now let's pray regarding the things we've just heard.